Hello again, you sick, twisted weather freaks, and welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed, and intellectually stimulating edition of This Week in Weather. It's Sunday evening. It's 10.30. I'm uh, your host, a meteorologist, DT, the captain of catastrophe, the colonel of confusion, the commander of chaos. Let's talk about weather for the next two weeks. Well, uh, we've got a couple things to talk about here. Obviously, uh, the January 25-26 uh, northeast snowstorm that's coming up here. Uh, the last week of January after the snowstorm, the last few days will be kind of mild a little bit. And then it looks like the first 15 days of February look pretty promising with a couple of different winter storm threats to uh, talk about. So let's get right to it and see what's going on here. Uh, first, our image here, we'll talk about this is the uh, next 48 hours, the amount of cold air that's coming in here. This is an impressive amount of cold air, obviously. Um, for uh, much of the country. This is finally getting the cold air in. Uh, the pattern has changed. The pattern has turned. And uh, this is something we have seen many times of the day 9 or day 10 models, but not at day 2. So that's what's important here. Now, this little low right here is going to bring some snow to the east, eastern portions of New England. A New Orleans trough, it could bring 3, 4, 5, or 6 inches of snow to the eastern areas in the Boston, and also some lake effect snows in this area. But this is a huge high, as you can see here. Uh, well, it's 1033. The high is not massive, but the cold air coming southward really is. So we are definitely going to feel it here over the next uh, 24 hours. All right. Uh, our next slide here, we're going to talk about the three different types of clipper lows. Now, what is a clipper low? You may have heard that term used before. A clipper low is a fast-moving, very energetic upper air feature that usually comes out of some portion of Canada and dives towards the northeast of the United States. Now, everybody or a lot of people in, that in the weather business who are weather hobbyists or meteorologists or just outright weather weenies know the term Alberta Clipper, but actually there are three types of Alberta Clippers. There's the classic Alberta Clipper, the second type which is the Saskatchewan Screamer, and the third type known as the Manitoba Mauler. Now these terminology came about by the late great uh, weather historian David Ludlam. I've used them for many years and I think they're absolutely uh, fitting and I don't see any reason to change that so I'll continue to use these terms. Let's talk about these different types of events here. The first example of a classic Alberta Clipper is the one from January 22nd, 2005. Now, some of you may remember this event. Uh, you may not. This was, a, this was a several years ago. <clears throat> but if you can see this event here, this is the surface map. And this is as of the, um, I guess, the morning of January 22nd. It was a Saturday. And there's our low, as you can see, right in here. Let me draw it in for you. You can see right there. There's the low. Over central Ohio Indiana, western Ohio, uh, yeah, Ohio, and here's a big giant high. Notice the high is extended. There's also a secondary high right in here in New England, sort of what we're going to be seeing here on this coming January uh, 25th, 26th. And then the next slide, what happens is, of course, you can see the green snow everywhere. There's Arctic air, but notice that the snow is not in Virginia, even though it's cold and it's not in Maryland. And the system goes, as uh, well, uh, let me draw it in here, you can see the track of it. It goes from here to here. Of course, and everybody north of it gets a very good clocking of snow. Now, how much snow actually fell? Well, let's take a look. See, this is the uh, surface map. And now, this is liquid. So, 0.49 is the liquid. But you can see in here, we've got the 6-inch line. You see this right here? This is the 6-inch line like this. Okay? And this is the 1-inch line. So, Richmond did, in Roanoke and so on and so forth, Fredericksburg, Charlottesville, did get an inch or two of snow out of this. But all the 6 inches of snow line was up here by D.C. northward, actually along the Pennsylvania-Maryland border, all up into Pennsylvania, New York, and New England. So, that's a pretty typical Alberta Clipper system. Very fast moving, very strong, and the fast movement is why you don't get huge snow amounts. Something in the atmosphere has to cause the system to slow down to block for it to become a monster storm. Now, this is the upper air map, and we can, this has got some similarities to what we're going to be seeing here later on this week. Here's the upper, the system comes out of uh, northwest, out of western Canada. You can see it right, right here. And then here's the upper air system of the jet stream, the disturbance over Iowa. Notice this big upper low here in Labrador. That's going to be very similar to what we're looking like. And then in the next screen here, uh, there's the system now over New York City or south and east New England. You can follow the X's. There was the track of the system. There's a very typical Alberta Clipper low. Okay. The next slide here, we'll talk about Manitoba Maulers. And the classic case of the Manitoba Mauler is the Great New England Blizzard of 1978. Yeah, many of you may remember this, or your folks may remember this if you're younger. We can talk, see this system here. This was a huge blizzard which hit uh, the northeast United States from Washington, D.C., northward. And uh, the Manitoba Mauler is distinguished. It comes out of Manitoba, Canada. 
So we have our three provinces here. In case you don't know this, you should know this. Here's Alberta. This is Saskatchewan. This is Manitoba. And this system comes out of Manitoba and it goes to the Great Lakes and it dives to Virginia and it caused a huge blizzard to form. Now, one of the reasons why the Manitoba Mauler is so dangerous is because in order to go from Manitoba to Virginia or Manitoba to Pennsylvania, the system has to develop a negative tilt when it reaches the coast and that causes explosive cyclogenesis. That's why the Manitoba Mauler is such a dangerous system. It is the least common of the three, but if it happens, it's a big deal. Okay, and uh, in case you did not see what happens here, there's the system. See the black dots? Look what it went. Wham! Right into Virginia. Sound effects are not necessary, but like I said, they do enhance the understanding of the meteorology. So there's the system diving towards the Virginia coast and blowing up and bombing everybody with two feet, three feet of snow in New England and northeastern United States. The third type is the Saskatchewan Screamer. And the classic example of this is the one for February 2010, a couple of years ago. This is the second storm, not the first one, which hit uh, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and Philadelphia in Snowmageddon or whatever the weather channel morons called it at that time. So let's talk about that system here. Um, actually, that's not the right map. So here it is. Uh, this is the uh, upper air map for uh, February 2009. And uh, if I can draw this in here, this upper air disturbance, as we can see, is over Iowa. And it came out of Saskatchewan. It's coming down this way. And the next slide, what we'll see is that it actually, um, well, there it is coming out of uh, the Dakotas. I've got these ones mixed up. So this is actually the first one here. Um, it's right here. And then the second one, let me clear this out, is here, as you can see, very nicely. So it came this way to this way to here. And then finally, the third one. Now it's over Virginia and got, they developed a negative tilt. You can see that. So the track was from, as we can see here, to here, to here. See what? Boom! Negative tilt. A negative tilt, just like that. And the storm exploded and it pounded Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Philadelphia, New Jersey, Maryland, with huge amounts of snow. And it was the second blizzard of the, of the uh, four-day event. And this is the actual surface map here. And let me call it, yeah, you can see the low bombing off off the coast. We all remember this event here in the big snow it had. So that is the, that is the Saskatchewan Screamer. That is, you know, so Alberta Clippers are the most likely, uh, most common type. Then you have the uh, Saskatchewan Screamer. And the third least common is the Manitoba Mauler, but that's the most dangerous. Now, this is the actual pattern here. We can talk about this for January 25th, this coming Friday. And what we're seeing is a bit of a P&A ridge here on the east coast, on the, excuse me, on the west coast. We can see that right here. Let me uh, call this up. There's our P&A ridge, but it's not huge. It doesn't go up to Alaska. It's a moderate P&A ridge because there's a big upper low here. And then there's one piece of energy here, another piece of energy here. And look, we have a huge polar vortex over eastern Canada again, just like we saw in the 2005 Alberta Clipper situation we looked at. And... As we go on, this is the GFS, and you can see the low here over Ohio and Louisville, Kentucky. Now, remember here in these maps, um, the thick uh, black, the thick blue line here, this is the rain snow line. So you can see it's like over D.C., north of Washington, north of Richmond and Charlottesville and Roanoke and, and all so and so forth. Kentucky's all rain. And again, look, we also have a little bit of a high here. See that? Here's the big high. And there's the second baby high over, very similar to what we saw in January 2005. Classic looking Alberta Clipper type of situation. And then the GFS takes it through New England. The rain snow line may get to New York City along coastal Connecticut. Much of it is already falling as snow. And it's a very nice, call. it's a very fast moving system. And the snow ratios are pretty high, but it's a typical Alberta Clipper. This is the GFS from 12Z today, the possible possible snowfall amounts and you can see some nice snowfall amounts in the Catskills in the mountains here uh, this is uh, you know up in this area here you've got several inches in Boston and Connecticut down towards New York City North central Pennsylvania now this may come down to DC it's possible the system could shift a little bit it's not out of the question we don't know that yet but for Richmond and rolling up for Charlottesville it's not going to be a big deal it's a I think it's going to be a complete miss at this point based upon what I'm saying this is the GFS uh, ensembles and you can see it's got the low, look at this, over Erie. I mean, that's really far north. And uh, it tracks, uh, you know, as you can see, um, like this and then like this. There you go. There's a you know, big giant high. Again, notice we have our high here and here, just like we saw in January 2005. Okay? So, and then it moves off the coast here, it cuts right through, and you can see, so it bombs, hits New England, New York City with a pretty good snowstorm, maybe Philly as well, it may go over to rain in Philly and the coastal areas of New York City, but most of what would fall would be snow. 
And this is the European from uh, 12Z today. And you can see, look at the low. It's over central, uh, actually over, uh, over, almost over Pittsburgh. And uh, Pittsburgh has gone over to uh, rain at this point or sleet, even though most of the precipitation here has fallen as snow on this map right here. You can see right in this area. And then the system goes from here, and it goes just like this. Now, it may redevelop on the coast. The low may actually go from here to um, here and then to here. So you can't necessarily assume it's going to take a straight line. It may do this. But it, it's a pretty good snowstorm. A lot of very, very cold air over the northeast. Very high snow ratios indeed. Now, this is the European model. The total snowfall amounts for the event uh, through January 26th. It's a 4 to 8-inch snowfall. Not a huge deal, but it's there. Okay? So, uh, you know, for the snow-starved areas in the northeast, notice the snow just gets down to Washington, D.C., Baltimore area. Going to be very close here. We still have four or five days to watch. It's possible it could shift 50 miles, so the D.C. folks need to pay attention to this. And this is the uh, European Ensemble. It looks the same thing. Boom. Now, it doesn't have as much warm air getting into Pittsburgh. Remember, if we go back here, remember how the warm air got into Pittsburgh and eastern Ohio? So the European Ensembles don't have that. You see? It's much, much uh, cooler, and it's, it's, it's the warm air only gets up into here. But it's the same general idea, and that's, that's what's important. Okay. Uh, let me go here. And then it moves off the coast. Again, it redevelops here off the Jersey coast in this area right in here. And uh, then it uh, bombs out. I mean, it's, a, it's not a huge storm, but it goes, you know, from here. Uh, let me do this again. It goes from here to here to here. And look at the cold air coming in behind this. My God, it's going to get cold and windy behind the system. Woo! And then look at the cold air. Just unbelievable amounts of cold air. Now, after that happens, there's a new trough in the European operational comes to the West Coast. The eastern United States, the entire Midwest, according to the European, warms up for, you can see the warm air in here, for a couple of days. It's not a huge deal. It looks to be a temporary event. There's the day 10. The European ensembles are much cooler. They don't have nearly, have a, nearly the same. And you can see a new ridge trying to develop um, up in this area, trying to get a new ridge forming in here. So it's not nearly as warm. It's a short-lived, couple-of-day warm period, two or three, maybe four days. So that's not too bad. And then beyond this, uh, this, is the Europe, this is the MJO. And one of the things about this MJO, which is really significant here, is look at all how it was constantly down in this area during the November, December, January. Or November, December, how it's constantly down in this area, 2, 3, and 4, and this is the warm cycle. Now we can see the MJO is in 7, and what does it do after that? Remember, phase 7 is the start of the cold pattern. Phase 8, uh, this is the European, you can see it very clearly now in phase 8, and the next one, it gets into phase, this European, these are the European weeklies, into phase 8 as well, by the time we get to the middle of February. Well, what does that pattern look like? Well, this is uh, February here. Uh, this is phase one, but this one is phase eight in, Febu in February. Look at this. Phase eight in February is the East Coast snowstorm MJO setup. You have a huge amount of blocking up here in Canada, and a deep persistent trough favored over the eastern United States. So uh, that's a pretty good signal. And then week three and week four, the models continue to show a lot of blocking here. This is the GFS. This is the C. Excuse me, the CFS. Week one. Well, we don't. We know where that's going to happen. This is week two here. Let's talk about this for a second. And uh, January 26th, you can see the uh, trough over the eastern United States. A lot of blocking here. So that's not really a surprise. Prize. A very cold pattern here in the 6 to 10 day. The cold air retreats a little bit at the end of January into early February, just a little bit. There is a potential here, again, we're looking at week two, some sort of system over the southeast that might affect North Carolina, Virginia with some snow or ice, maybe. And then um, week three and week four, look how cold it is. My God, that's a cold looking map. And then, and we can see in week three and week four here, a super strong negative NEO in the middle, the first week of February, deep trough on the East Coast. I continue to think there's going to be something around February 2nd to February 8th. I don't see any reason to go against that. And you can see that the uh, precipitation chances on week four, there's something in the southeast to watch out for as well. That's the forecast. That's how I see this week. Anyway, this is Meteorologist DT. I'll talk to you soon.